Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. My name is Belen Bonilla, and I am the Strategic Engagement Associate here at PRRI, the Public Religion Research Institute. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to conducting independent research at the intersection of religion, culture, and public policy. Today, we are joined by a fantastic lineup of expert panelists from across the country who will be discussing findings from our latest survey report, The Politics of Gender, Pronouns, and Public Education. With anti-trans legislation sort of making its rounds through various states, this discussion is all the more relevant. So we're excited for this opportunity to spend some time diving, diving deeper with all of you into the perceptions Americans have about gender and what is appropriate to teach in public schools. So we'll have a dedicated time for questions towards the end of the presentation. So as questions arise in your minds about our data, trends, findings, or methodologies, feel free to plop them into the Q&A box below. And we'll be hearing first from Dr. Melissa Deckman, who I'm now pleased to introduce. Dr. Melissa Deckman is our fearless leader and the CEO of Public Religion Research Institute. She is the author of Tea Party Women, which examines the role of women in conservative politics. And she is also the author of the award-winning book, School Board Battles, The Christian Right in Local Politics. She is our um, accomplished political scientist with decades of experience whose expertise has been featured in the New York Times, CNN, The Hill, Washington Post, Wall Street, Wall Street Journal, and Politico, among other outlets. So without further ado, Melissa, over to you. All right. Let's start a little bit about the methodology of our politics of gender report. Um, the survey that results we're presenting today come from a survey that we conducted uh, in March from Ipsos Knowledge Panel. So it's a representative sample of more than 5,000 adults, ages 18 and up, living in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. The margin of error for the sample is approximately one and a half percentage points. And I wanted to say thank you to the Arcus Foundation, the Gill Foundation, and the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation for their generous support for allowing us to be able to conduct this survey. Next slide, please. I wanted to start first with Americans' view on the gender binary. This is a question that we've asked here at PRI for the last couple of years. And specifically, if we go to the next slide, um, we're taking a look at Americans with respect to their views on gender. And what we're graphing here are those Americans who feel strongly that there are only two genders, man or woman, or think that there are only two genders but do not feel strongly about it. The other options that respondents were given in the survey was they could indicate that they think there's a range of many gender identities, but do not feel strongly about it, or feel strongly that there's a range of many possible gender identities. So looking first really just at those who believe there are only two genders, we find um, from 2021 to 2023, an increase in the number of Americans who thinks that there are only two genders, man or woman. We see an increase among Republicans, uh, but Republicans largely already believed that there were only two genders in 2021, but we see a slight increase in 2023. We do see a, an increase as well among independents and Democrats, but I think the larger thing to take away from this slide is that partisanship really influences Americans' attitudes on whether or not there's a gender binary, with Republicans being more than twice as likely as Democrats to believe that there's only two genders, men or women. We also see, if you look at the next slide, that attitudes about the gender binary are really strongly correlated as well with media trust. And so we ask Americans pretty routinely here at PRI where they get their news and information, who they trust the most for the news and information. And we find among Americans who say that they watch very conservative news, these would be outlets like Newsmax or OAMN, um, we see very strong, broad support for the idea that there's only two genders. There's a slight drop here, uh, but it's not significantly significant because it's not necessarily a huge amount of Americans nationally. Where we do see an increase is among Fox News viewers. And so in 2021, 81% of Fox News viewers said that there was only a gender binary. That's increased even higher in 2023, which is probably not a surprise because this issue is one that is being um, broadcast a lot on Fox News in recent months. Among Americans who really just don't trust TV news as their, their source of, of news, most trusted news, we see slight increases. Among Americans who watch what we call mainstream news, the broadcast network, CNN, that sort of thing, we do see a slight increase uh, among those who believe there's only two genders. But again, I think the larger point to take away here is 
really trusting conservative news outlets lends people or leads people to really strongly believe that there's only two genders. We also find on the next slide that there is a relationship between religious tradition and trends with respect to the gender binary. Um, among white evangelical Protestants, probably not surprisingly, we see an increase in those who believe that there's only two genders um, from 86 to 92%. We also see strong levels of support for this idea of a gender binary among Latter-day Saints, Hispanic, Hispanic Protestants as well. Um, if you go to the bottom of the chart though, um, there is no monolithic religious position on the gender binary. Jewish Americans, for example, are the least likely to believe that there's only two genders. And with look at those who are religiously unaffiliated, again, far less support than Americans who belong to more conservative religious traditions and stating that there's a gender binary. Next slide. We also wanted to get a sense of Americans' attitudes about the, the frequency with which we discuss these sorts of issues in our politics. And 62% of Americans express some fatigue when it comes to talking about gender and pronouns. Um, but again, we're struck that there's strong partisan differences here. Republicans are more than twice as likely as Democrats to agree that people spend too much time talking about gender and pronouns. Next slide. One of the things we also wanted to look at was the extent to which Americans have friendship networks, close friends, of members who are part of the LGBT community and how that influences their attitudes on all of these political um, ideas that we're talking about now. So if we go to the next slide, this is just a slide that indicates the percent of Americans who have a close personal relationship, which means that they have a close friend, a family member, or they themselves identify as part of the LGBTQ community. And one of the things you'll notice, of course, is that among all Americans now, a majority say that they have a close friend, a close personal relationship, or they themselves are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Um, and that actually many Americans, regardless of, trans, of, of, of generation, we're finding do have close personal relationships with someone who at least who are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. On the other end, however, when, it looks, when we look at the percentage of Americans who have close relationships with Americans who identify as transgender or those who use gender neutral pronouns, we see that there's far less, um, far fewer Americans who indicate those close personal relationships. Part of this, of course, is likely a function of the fact that um, there are fewer transgender Americans than gay, lesbian, or bisexual Americans, and there are fewer Americans who are using gender neutral pronouns. I think the one thing that's interesting here is we wanted you to take a look at Gen Z Americans, because Gen Z Americans express, uh, essentially are far more likely to have friends who use to use gender neutral pronouns and are more likely to have transgender uh, friends and people as part of their, their networks who are transgender. Next slide, please. So knowing someone who is part of the LGBT community um, really does influence Americans' attitudes on a range of things, including the extent to which people are comfortable learning that a friend is le lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or transgender. Our first slide here looks at um, the extent to which Americans would be comfortable learning that a friend is lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And what we find here, when we break the data down by people that have close rel relationships with someone who's lesbian, gay, or bisexual, an acquaintance who's lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or doesn't know someone who is lesbian, gay, or bisexual, there's very, very differences of opinion on comfort levels with having friends uh, indicating that they're lesbian, gay, or bisexual. I think what's really interesting, if you look at the green bars on the right, um, having a close relationship with someone who identifies as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, only about 14% of Americans say they would be therefore uncomfortable learning that a friend is lesbian, gay, or bisexual. If we look at the bottom, among Americans who don't know someone who's lesbian, gay, or bisexual uh, in their friendship network, or they themselves are, are lesbian, gay, or bisexual, we see 44% of those Americans would express some discomfort, being uncomfortable with learning that a friend is lesbian, gay, or bisexual. We see very similar uh, trends you'll see on the next slide when it comes to um, comfort levels with learning that a friend is transgender and actually pretty remarkably similar to the previous slide. So having someone that you know um, who is, you have a close relationship with someone who's trans, only 17% of those Americans say they would be uncomfortable learning that a friend is transgender. transgender. Again, going to the bottom for Americans who don't know anyone closely who's transgender, 42% 
would say that they're somewhat or very uncomfortable learning that a friend is transgender. Next slide, please. Um, we wanted to also go over some of our findings with respect to the discussion of these sorts of issues in public schools. And so we have a couple of slides here to finish out on America's attitudes about the extent to which we should be discussing these issues in American schools. Uh, so for example, on the first slide, we ask on the first data point, we ask Americans the extent to which they agree that public schools are giving students harmful information about gender and sexual orientation. And we're struck here that um, less than a majority agree with that sentiment. Again, however, we see very, very stark partisan differences. 80% of Republicans believe that public schools are giving out harmful information about these topics compared to just one in four Democrats. Um, when it comes to parental rights, this is a theme that you hear a lot today, especially on the political right, that public schools are interfering too much with what their children are being taught. 53% of Americans agree with that. But again, there are stark partisan differences. 79% of Republicans compared to 31% of Democrats. On the issue of whether young people are being peer pressured into being transgender, this is a theme you often hear on uh, many conservative websites, conservative news outlets. Um, we, we find that a majority of Americans disagree with that. Only 43% of Americans agree with that, that concept. But again, we see Republicans being far more likely to agree, more than three times as likely to agree with that sentiment compared with Democrats. Next slide. We also asked the extent to which um, Americans believe that teaching about these topics when it comes to LGBTQ topics in such education is appropriate or never appropriate. And we also were able to break that down by at what point during, um, during education, elementary school, middle school, high school, are these things appropriate to be discussing? And so if you look at the first two slides, um, we find, for example, that 24% going to the right of Americans say that talking about opposite sex romantic relationships is never appropriate. Um, but if you ask them about whether same sex romantic relationship discussion is appropriate, it's 34%. So there's definitely a, a rise when it comes to talking about same sex relationships. But again, the overall trends are that most Americans think these topics of conversation are appropriate in public schools. Um, if you look, for example, at the next two bullet points, um, is it ever appropriate to discuss that some people do not consider themselves to be a man or woman? This would be essentially uh, talking about non-binary issues or that some people are transgender. We're struck with by the fact that most Americans think that in fact, it is appropriate to have these conversations in public schools. Only about a third, slightly more than a third would say we should never be talking about those, those issues in public schools. Last but not least, uh, we were really surprised at the extent to which Americans broadly support sex education that includes explanations of birth control, condoms, and other forms of contraception. Only 8% of Americans said that we should never talk about that in public schools. This finding, I think, is somewhat um, uh, interesting because it was really just only about two decades ago during the George W. Bush administration where abstinence-based sex education was actively being debated. Um, and now it looks like there's a very broad consensus that talking about contraception in public schools is appropriate. And in fact, a majority of Americans say it's appropriate in middle school. Um, we also threw in a question about whether or not this, this kind of abstinence-based sex education should be emphasized. And I think it's telling that 30% of Americans say that we should never talk about that, which I think indicates to us that having comprehensive sex education that talks about con that con contraception uh, is in fact enjoys more widespread support than abstinence-based only sex education. Next slide, please. Um, just very quickly, we wanted to get a sense in our report if parents and non-parents felt differently on these issues. And in fact, on most of these measures and throughout the report, um, we find that there are very few significant differences. We did find a little bit of a significant difference in the sense that 37% of parents say it's never appropriate to talk about um, same-sex relationships compared to 32% of non-parents. Um, but again, we're struck with the idea that uh, it's not really a majority of parents or non-parents at all among the American public. And by parents, we're talking about those who have uh, children currently school age. And finally, I think our last slide um, looks at views on parental rights. Um, again, just to uh, reiterate, 53% um, of all Americans say that uh, public schools interfere too much with parents' rights. We don't see a difference between parents and non-parents, but we do see a difference when it comes to partisanship. 79% uh, of Republicans agree with that sentiment compared to just 31% of Democrats. 
All right, I think we're at our last slide now. All right, thank you, Melissa, for kicking us off. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce to all of you our expert panelists that we have joining us today. So first up, we've got Dr. Heath Brown, who is an associate professor of public policy at John Jay College of Criminal Justice at the City University of New York. He is host of the podcast, New Books in Political Science and author of the 2021 book, Homeschooling the Right, How Conservative Education Activism Erodes the State. He's been an expert contributor in The Hill, The Atlantic, and American Prospect Magazine. Um, additionally, we have members of our very own esteemed PRRI Public Fellows cohort whose research is focused on LGBTQ rights with us. Uh, so first up, we have Dr. Kelsey Burke. Dr. Kelsey Burke is an Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She is the author of Christians Undercover, Evangelicals and Sexual Pleasure on the Internet, as well as the forthcoming book, The Pornography Wars, The Past, Present, and Future of America's Obscene Obsession. Her cutting-edge research covers religious freedom laws, LGBTQ rights, evangelical women's ministries, and public debates over pornography, and has been supported by a number of grants and fellowships, including from the National Science Foundation. She has been published in both top academic journals and outlets, including The Guardian, Newsweek, Slate, and The Washington Post. Next, Dr. Andrew Flores is an assistant professor of government at the American University School of Public Affairs and a visiting scholar at the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law. His recent research activities include the use of survey experiments on opinions about trans people and trans rights, patterns of violence and victimization directed at LGBT people, quantitative approaches to intersectionality, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and disparities in well-being between LGBT and non-LGBT people, and demographic methods to estimate the number of people who identify as LGBT. His research has appeared in many prestigious peer-reviewed journals, including Science Advances and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Susanna Grivulskaya is a PRRI public fellow and an assistant professor of history at the California State University in San Marcos. Her research specializes in modern U.S. history and studies the relationship between sexuality and religion. Her first book, Disgraced, How Sex Scandals Transformed American Protestantism, is a sweeping religious and cultural history of ministerial sex scandals in the 19th and 20th centuries. Her work has appeared in both academic journals and popular outlets and was honored by the 2019-2020 Virginia Ramey Mullencott Award from the LGBTQ Religious Archives Network. So we'll be hearing first from Dr. Heath Brown. Uh, Dr. Heath Brown, over to you. Thank you, Belen, for the introduction uh, and the invitation to serve as a respondent today. Uh, as you note, uh, I'm Heath Brown. I'm on the faculty of the John Jay College, as well as the Urban Education Program at the CUNY Graduate Center in New York City. Uh, there are dozens of interesting findings from this fascinating survey, uh, and I'm curious about so many of the implications of them. Uh, and I was just thinking, I think I would lose a good deal of sleep about these very low name recognition figures uh, if I was running Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley's campaign. Uh, those are buried in some of the cross tabs. Thankfully, those are not my jobs. Uh, instead, um, I will reserve my time for a few thoughts on the section on public education. Now, nearly 20 years ago, Pew reported that almost eight in 10 Americans supported teaching about sex education, specifically various forms of birth control, including a majority of every religious denomination except evangelical Protestants. Ten years later, researchers from Planned Parenthood published a study focused just on parents. They found nearly nine in 10 parents said it was very important for sex education to be taught in high school. Though there was a partisan split on this question, still three quarters of Republican parents said that sex education was very important. That was 2014. Nearly 10 years later, the findings from this survey are somewhat different. How different is a matter of interpretation. Uh, that a slight majority of Americans say it is appropriate for sex education to be taught in schools, and just 40 per, uh, 46% of Republicans, I was left wondering why this change. Uh, what has happened to this growing consensus that sex education in one form or another was a good thing for teachers to instruct on in public schools. Uh, 
Now, to be sure, a lot has happened over the last 10 to 20 years. Uh, this most recent iteration of the conflict over school curriculum has surely impacted public opinion. I know we'll hear a lot about this today as we already have from Dr. Deckman, and I imagine we'll debate whether this uh, figure is rising or falling. But there's also an important difference between asking parents about what belongs in a public school curriculum and asking the public overall. First-hand experiences, especially recent ones, obviously matter a lot. Now, we know this from other parts of this very survey. Recall, uh, support for teaching that some people are transgender is higher, though only slightly, among those who have a friend or family member who is transgender. I suspect something similar is going on here. My guess is that some of these attitudes of the public at large towards sex education is tracking closely with other political attitudes, including some of those unrelated to sex education, whereas those attitudes of parents are more closely related to sex education itself. Now, I'm not a parent of a middle or high school student, so I can just speculate here, and I'm eager to hear what others have to say on this point. There's also some really interesting things going on in this survey with parent rights. Uh, but here, I was a bit surprised in the opposite direction. Parent rights has been taken up as a rallying call for conservatives over the last several years, though the antecedents of this idea go back much further. I recently wrote about this theme in respect to the homeschooling movement's 50-year history, though maybe we can center the attacks on Hillary Clinton in the early 1990s as a more recent genesis for this movement. Dr. Deckman's 2004 book on school board politics is a good guide for that period in US education. In either case, parent rights has been brewing for a while now, and this inviting idea that parents possess a set of rights to raise their children, free from interference, including from public schools and teachers in some cases. Like any effective slogan, parent rights are hard to oppose, especially in the abstract. It is for that reason that I was surprised that only half, 53%, agree that public schools interfere, interfere too much with parent rights to, deter, to determine what their children are taught. I'm surprised that this figure isn't much higher, especially given the mass movement to promote parent rights in states like Virginia and Florida, which have garnered national attention in the media. Why hasn't this caught on more? And why do 46% uh, of respondents disagree that the public schools interfere too much with parent rights? Again, as with sex education, I think as we move from the abstract to the concrete, views change. Parent rights might make sense in the abstract, but in practice, I surmise that many parents don't see their rights as in conflict with the decisions made by most public school teachers. The cross tabs in the survey on age cohorts from the survey bear this out to some extent. Here, also some disaggregation in the future would help to clarify some things. For example, do these views differ by type of public school, charter versus traditional, or across school sectors, public versus private? And maybe most importantly, when Republican parents are asked about whether their own schools not an abstract idea of a school, interfere with their rights, might we see very different attitudes revealed? Now, as we want to say, we can leave the, uh, some of those uh, uh, questions for future research and our discussion later. Uh, until, until then, I will hand things off to Kelsey Burke, who will go next. Uh, thank you all for your time to share my thoughts, and I look forward to hearing from everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown, and thanks to everybody at PRRI for the invitation. Uh, like Heath, who came before me and his many astute observations, I'm really interested in the extent to which these survey data match or don't 
broader political discourse. So today I'll focus specifically on transgender equality. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe in the chat for participants, if we could share the link to the recent spotlight, which includes some data that isn't in the report um, that is the focus of the webinar. Uh, thanks. So when we look to mainstream media and popular pundits, talking about transgender equality, they often rely on this narrative that skepticism or hostility toward transgender people comes from many different kinds of social actors. So not just conservative Christians, but also other figures, um, most notably some feminists. So let me just talk through some examples. In the United States, there's a group of feminist activists called the Women's Liberation Front or WOLF, that makes a bold claim when it comes to their opposition of transgender identity and rights. They say that their position is based on core principles of radical feminism. Since 2014, they've worked to challenge advances in transgender rights in sports, prisons, and other domains. Um, the investigative journalist working for Mother Jones, Madison Polly, um, documented how conservative politicians worked alongside evangelical organizations, such as the Alliance Defending Freedom and the Family Policy Alliance, um, in collaboration with some members of the Women's Liberation Front to carefully draft anti-trans legislation that first appeared in South Dakota. And Wolf is not alone in their perspective. So we can think to the popular podcast called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, framing the famous author as a feminist who's been unfairly harassed for her stance on transgender issues. Pamela Paul, the opinion columnist for The New York Times, says that inclusive language and reproductive health care, so for example, talking about pregnant people or bodies with vaginas, that this limits the rights of cisgender women. So the gender and politics survey, I think, provides really necessary and unprecedented empirical data to contextualize who opposes transgender people. And despite the rhetoric surrounding these feminists that are often labeled as TERFs or trans exclusionary radical feminists, this survey data suggests that Americans who self identify as feminists are, in fact, overwhelmingly supportive of transgender identity and rights, uh, much more so than white evangelical Protestants, the group leading the charge against transgender equality, and also much more so than Americans as a whole. So let me just walk through a couple of the measures for respondents who identify as feminists and say that that label is very important to them. For this group, 28% believe there are only two genders, man or woman, in contrast to 65% of Americans overall and 92% of white evangelical Protestants. 71% of self-identified feminists say there are a range of gender identities, compared to 34% of all Americans and only 8% of white evangelicals. Feminists are also more likely to know transgender people and people who use gender-neutral pronouns than are Americans as a whole, and they express greater levels of comfort. For the question um, asking when and whether it's appropriate to teach public school children that some people are transgender, um, a topic that Dr. Brown spoke to a little bit, only 10% of feminists say that it is never appropriate to teach in K-12 through schools compared to 34% of all Americans and 64% of white evangelical Protestants. 81% of feminists oppose laws that prevent parents from allowing their child to receive medical care for a gender transition. This is a view held by 56% of all Americans and only 35% um, of white evangelicals hold that view. So I live in Nebraska, which is one of the states that passed this kind of law this year. Um, I attended public testimonies and legislator debates throughout our legislative session, and I noticed that their arguments were often rooted in a kind of feminist logic, making it sound like banning gender-affirming health care for transgender youth was actually a way to protect girls, since those who seek medical support for gender transition in recent years are disproportionately assigned female at birth. But these data point to a different picture. 
that those who identify as feminists oppose such laws and actually support a wide variety of other measures related to transgender identity and equality. I think this import empirical data is really important context for the public and political discourse that we're hearing. Next, you'll hear from my PRRI Public Fellows colleague and friend, Dr. Andrew Flores. Thanks, Dr. Burke, um, and uh, thank you to PRI for inviting me to speak to um, these important data. Um, I uh, decided to reserve my remarks on the generational differences that we're seeing um, in uh, this survey, um, as well as kind of speak more broadly about what those implications might be. Um, so uh, I, as many of you may recall, in the uh, 2022 midterm elections, uh, there are some data points that kind of signal that uh, younger voters uh, sort of canceled out um, uh, the voting strength of older voters uh, to a degree to which um, what some may, might have thought of as a major turning point in American politics in terms of this red wave never really actually occurred. Um, and so I think it's always important to think about what are younger individuals in American society as they enter into the electorate? What are they thinking about? Um, what are their politics? And how does the shifting dynamics and generational change that's happening in American politics sort of recasts the discussion or recasts political debates in different ways? Um, and so intriguingly, um, uh, uh, one of the first things I will talk about is kind of the survey uh, results indicated to us that uh, there was um, um, somewhat of a consensus to a degree in which the American public believes in a, a, a gender binary. Um, as so much so that say 68% uh, of the boomer generation believe in a gender binary while and also 57% uh, of Gen Z also stated that they believe that, the, that there are only two genders. Um, um, and so, uh, and some individuals may think that younger generation, you would have expected a wider, a, bit, a bigger generational gap in terms of this belief. Um, but I think it's important to contextualize those top lines by understanding the way in which gender operates in our society more broadly. Um, some social psychologists have uh, really uh, uh, developed a line of research that sort of indicates that we as a society and um, even beyond American society are, you know, it, taught and uh, 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 introduced to gender by at the point of our birth, so much so that um, it, uh, there have been experiments with babies with, that people are told this baby is a boy or this baby is a girl and people's own behavioral reactions to how they just interact with that baby are markedly different. So the, this, this construct of gender is something that permeates throughout our society um, uh, and permeates uh, uh, from time of birth till time of death. Um, and so to keep that in mind in terms of contextualizing why you're seeing that there still is a majority of the American public that does think that there are two genders uh, and only two genders. Um, um, I think on the flip side, um, to recontextualize the idea that 35% of the American public um, uh, thinks that there is a gender spectrum, um, uh, I think is also something that should be considered more remarkable than say unremarkable. Um, that, uh, that, be that because this gender binary system is something that we are all kind of in introduced to um, and uh, many individuals adhere to, um, that uh, you would not necessarily expect a priori that, uh, that there would be um, a good 35% of the American public that actually takes a more diverse viewpoint on gender. Um, and, and so I do think that that was one uh, generational difference to, to point out, but then also kind of an explanation or a way to think about kind of why you're seeing this kind of gender binarism, binarism, that may not be a word, may not be a word, uh, 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 in the American public. Um, the second thing that I thought would be helpful to contextualize was the top line finding around um, whether or not people are spending too much time um, uh, worrying about pronoun use 
Um, and here you still see a clear generational divide where 70% of boomers said that uh, they're spending too much time uh, uh, talking around talking about pronouns, uh, where 57% of Gen Z uh, kind of held the same viewpoint. But even though we're seeing that uh, majorities of both generations are saying we're spending too much time about pronouns, the underlying root of what may be explaining that, that pattern may be different. Um, um, and not to extrapolate too much, but, um, but as being a university professor, I often see now some of my most progressive and gender diverse students rolling their eyes when we talk about doing introductions and talking about gender pronouns. Um, um, and, um, and sometimes, and some recent research has also indicated that, um, say, requiring people at the very beginning of, say, a business meeting or of a, of a classroom instruction to um, give their gender pronouns may actually be pretty stressful and taxing for some of trans or non-binary students who may not necessarily wish to disclose such information at a point in time or may actually push them back into a type of closet that because they're not necessarily really comfortable yet um, disclosing their, um, their gender identity to others. Um, and so, you know, so we have to think about what is this top line telling us? And is this telling us something different from um, a, a, a boomer generation perspective from a Gen Z generational perspective? And this can be a mix of opinions where some people may be, yes, we're talking about gender pronouns too much or prioritizing pronouns too much uh, because they're not necessarily that bothered by people's gender pronouns. And uh, on that point, uh, there are clear generational divides in terms of just the comfort of using they, them pronouns or, um, or the comfort of just using the pronouns that people prefer to use with younger generations, both Gen Z and millennials, very or somewhat comfortable with just, you know, going with the flow um, compared to older generations. Um, and so, um, and so uh, to both say that we have these top line findings that are telling us there's a belief in a gender binary, and that there's people that are concerned about pronoun use, but that concern has different origins and that younger generations are kind of, they're kind of ready to kind of be, uh, um, at least the majority of them are kind of ready to just kind of be comfortable with what you wanna be called uh, uh, and use the pronouns that you want to use. And let's move the conversation to something else. Um, um, and then the third part that, I'll, that I wanna point to are the, generational differences in the political attitudes, um, say between uh, uh, Gen Z, the millennials and older generations. Um, and one thing that this survey kind of points out to us is actually how close and politically aligned um, Gen Z is to the millennial generation. And so as we're thinking about generational turnover and generational change, those two generations, um, which now comprise, say, 18-year-olds up to um, uh, uh, somewhat uh, mid, uh, mid-40s, or say, 42, um, that is going to be the new uh, American public as societies change, right? And so their political attitudes are markedly different and markedly more supportive of LGBTQ equality across numerous dimensions. Um, and so, um, um, and one thing that I would want, want to say here is that there are still differences, say, within generations. Um, uh, there are still, uh, say, gender uh, uh, differences, uh, say, between respondents who identify as men and respondents who identify as women, that there is a gender gap between uh, uh, even among Gen Z. But even among Gen Z men, they are still much more pro LGBTQ than uh, older generations were, are, are, are. Um, and, uh, and one thing that I wanted to point out is that I wrote a spotlight for PRI not too long ago, kind of looking at different generational cohorts um, and uh, their political attitudes by partisanship. And one thing that I found in that analysis is that um, if you looked at Gen Z Republicans and compared their attitudes to say uh, boomer Republicans, that they actually aren't that different in their political attitudes. Like partisanship does shape kind of uh, how people kind of think about um, LGBTQ rights uh, more broadly. But what this is also indicating 
is that there's a smaller share of Gen Zs and millennials that are identifying as Republican. And so as these younger individuals, especially Gen Z, are entering into politics and learning about politics and seeing what the parties stand for, that there could be potential broader political ramifications for having a much more pro-LGBTQ mindset and seeing in this two-party system where the Republican Party stands. Um, and so that could uh, potentially harm, say, Republican elections in not, now, but then also in uh, moving forward. Um, um, and so, um, and with that, um, uh, I will pass on uh, my comments uh, off to Dr. Susanna uh, Krivoskaya. Thank you, Andrew. Pleased to be here. And I'll begin just by saying that I'm a historian, so my expertise really lies in the ways things have changed over time in the past. But I do study the relationship between religion and sexuality. So these data are, of course, really fascinating to me as well. And what intrigued me in this PRI survey was this question of how knowing transgender people might change the way Americans think of issues that affect trans people. As many have pointed out already, this is an especially timely topic, given the disproportionate amount of press coverage that trans issues currently receive, as well as the many concerted efforts by state legislatures to further marginalize this already vulnerable population. We know from previous PRI surveys that Americans consistently perceive trans people to be among the most discriminated against minorities but I've written a spotlight about how that understanding of trans people's vulnerability does not seem to move the public to support policies that would lessen this discrimination, which is of course a troubling finding, particularly in light of the fact that despite the present moral panics surrounding trans and non-binary people's existence, we should keep in mind that transgender adults represent only 0.5% of the population. Compare this to the fact that 6.7% of adult Americans identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, minus the T. So perhaps it's not terribly surprising that while more than 75% of Americans know someone who is gay, lesbian, or bi, only a third say that they know someone who is trans. And as Melissa has already pointed out, this number is even smaller when we look at close personal relationships only 11% of Americans report having close friends or family members who are trans or being trans themselves. There have been only a handful of studies on whether contact with trans people can shift public opinion. And I should point out that many of these studies have involved our esteemed colleague, Dr. Andrew Flores. Um, the latest studies have suggested that contact can result in positive attitudes toward trans rights. And PRRI survey seems to confirm this finding. For instance, when it comes to ideas about whether there are only two genders, those who know trans people are less likely to affirm the gender binary with only 40% believing that there are only two genders compared to 65% of all Americans. Those who do not know any trans people are on the opposite side of the issue. 75% of them believe that there are only two genders and only one in four believe in a range of gender identities. People who know trans people are also more comfortable with being told that a friend uses gender neutral pronouns with 55% feeling somewhat or very comfortable compared to the national average of 35%. Still 17% of people who know trans people Said, say that they would feel uncomfortable with a friend telling them that they're transgender, which is less than the national 41% average, but still somewhat surprising given the hypothesis that contact with trans people leads to more positive attitudes. Then again, it's possible that people who know trans people also disapprove of their gender identity, which would explain that number. The same explanation could apply to the fact that almost half of the people who know trans people believe that young people are being peer pressured into being transgender, at least to some degree, with only a slight majority of 53% disagreeing with that statement. 
All this is to say that PRI seems to confirm other scholarly findings that contact and visibility of trans people can lead to more positive attitudes toward them. However, the survey also confers, confirms just how vulnerable this group is to discrimination and harmful narratives perpetuated, especially in today's moral panics. So I'll end there and pass it on to Melissa and invite the other panelists to come back on screen as well. Uh, thank you everyone for your wonderful insightful comments. Um, I strongly encourage our viewers to go check out all those wonderful spotlights that our fellows uh, discussed. I think it'll give you more context and understanding about our findings today. So please uh, check that out. So at this time, I just wanted to uh, start off our conversation before we turn to questions and answers from the audience uh, by talking specifically to some of our panelists. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a group question here, uh, at least for Heath and for Kelsey. Um, both he and, and Kelsey talked about distinct constituencies, right, contrasting the attitudes of distinct constituencies, for example, looking at parental rights and Republicans, especially, but feminists, in, in the case of, of Kelsey's comments, who um, have sort of some distinct attitudes and maybe some surprising attitudes, given the media narrative about um, feminism and attitudes on transgender rights. So I'm wondering, um, based on the survey results, and given that you often look at the lens of, of those sorts of constituencies and understanding uh, these sorts of attitudes, did any parts of the survey report maybe better help you understand or rethink your understanding of the composition of those groups or the motivations of those groups in terms of their, their politics? And so maybe what surprised you in the survey re re report based on your own expertise? And maybe start with Kelsey, you good to start and then moving to Heath? <laughs> yeah, I can jump in. That's a great question, Melissa. Thank you. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind right away for me that you spoke to a little bit in your remarks are changes over time to some of these questions that PRI PRRI has been asking over the past few years. So starting in 2016, we see that like white evangelicals, for example, always have the, the strongest levels of opposition, but not to the same extent that we see today in 2021 and then in 2023, that that opposition seems to be increasing. And that's interesting to me because um, the discourse coming from um, conservative Christian activists is like these beliefs about gender and sexuality have always been this way, that they're core beliefs to their faith. And while I think that's true to some extent, they haven't shown up in the survey or public poll data that it wasn't on their radar in the same way, these measures of transgender equality, as we're seeing today. So the way that those beliefs about gender and sexuality manifest do change over time. And I think that's why it's particularly important to continue to be asking these questions, because we see that they can actually change quite dramatically and quite quickly. Thank you. Yeah, I can uh, follow uh, along on that. And I think there were uh, two strains of this that uh, of, of the survey findings that um, sort of aligned with some some thoughts that I've been having. The, the first is this nationalization of the debates on public schools. Uh, and I and I think that's hard to um, avoid, especially coming out of the pandemic. And I think um, that's something that I expect, my expectations are that that will recede, um, that, that uh, public education will, will not um, sort of have this nationalization uh, in the same way that it's had over the last several years. And I think some of the findings of this survey reflect just that. Um, that's my suspicion, is that some of that will recede uh, as the, this, this national uh, the, this issue that came at the, the nexus of public education for many people uh, and public health uh, will recede into the way it's more typically been. And the second thing that uh, the survey findings, especially those around parental rights, had me thinking a lot about is, is the distinction between parental rights and parental obligations. And uh, I, I was... Um, I think struck by the, the effectiveness of the rhetoric of parental rights uh, 
uh, versus kind of how hollow the concept ultimately is, especially when it's not expressed uh, in correspondence with a discussion of parental obligations. Uh, I think that's also something that that struck me as coming out of the pandemic is very important. And, and I think it's a, it's a um, dimension of the conversation about parental rights, which surely isn't going away, that I think would um, enrich and, and deepen that, that conversation. So I think those would be my, uh, the, the two things that this really got me thinking about. Great, thank you for, for those observations. I wanted to address my next question um, to Susanna and to, to Andrew. Um, you know, I think one of the things I'm struck about in, in your comments, especially Andrew in talking about demographic shifts, shifts um, when it comes to growing racial diversity and higher percentages of our nation actually identifying as LGBTQ, and I thank you also for uh, talking about the percentage of, of Americans who sort of fit into those uh, categories, uh, Suzanne, I think that's helpful context as well. Do you think that with generations becoming more likely, to, or actually generations becoming our Gen Z and subsequent generations becoming more diverse on all these measures, do you think that that's going to change or shift the needle on a host of the things that we asked about in the survey? So maybe start with, with Andrew and then go to Susanna. Thanks, Melissa. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, uh, the compositional differences between the generations are, of course, one uh, element in terms of explaining why we're seeing such stark divides. Um, the younger generation, uh, younger generations are much more racial, ethnically diverse, which also means that they have interactions with people who are, are racially and ethnically different from themselves. Um, uh, and, and if you actually look at, say, rates of interaction and say uh, both with LGBT people, but then also with people of different races or ethnicities, there are, you know, generational differences in those patterns. And, you know, and those personal experiences do kind of extrapolate to how people form their political opinions and attitudes. Um, um, and then secondly, uh, the younger generation is vastly more likely to identify as LGBTQ in some way. Even in the current survey poll, um, uh, what 16%, uh, I think, uh, if I remember off the top of my head, I, of, a, of Gen Z identify um, as LGB um, um, and a higher percent uh, compared to 4% of boomers or the silent generation, right? So that's what fourfold uh, uh, increase, right? Um, um, and uh, while identities can shift and sexualities and genders can sometimes be fluid over the life course, if those statistics remain constant, you're looking at a vastly different, you know, American public. Um, and, uh, and if uh, current findings around LGBT voters remain true as time goes forward, LGBT voters are one of the most progressive and democratic, you know, coalitions despite being racial, ethnically diverse, socioeconomically different, living in various parts of the country. And there's something that brings this incredibly diverse group of people into one coalesced political voice. Um, uh, uh, so much so that if you look at say exit poll data, that some really, really close elections would have gone the other way if there were no such thing as an LGBT voter or if LGBT voters just stayed at home, right? Um, and so, uh, so that is going to have lots of political ramifications, especially if LGBT people um, uh, feel like their identities are being politicized, feel like the, that there are certain parties that are trying to constrain their abilities um, to just go about their lives. So yes, yeah, so I do think that as time goes forward that there are going to be massive shifts in the, uh, in, in the political discourse. And it I may also be a reflection of our current political moment and the politicization of transgender people. Um, there's been some good reporting that kind of indicates that, <clears throat> that uh, some conservative social movement organizations uh, uh, after uh, Burgerfell v. Hodges and marriage equality uh, were sort of trying to find what was going to be the next controversial issue that would get people mobilized. And that they actually were kind of just throwing a bunch of topics at the wall and, and testing things out and seeing what stuck, right? And, um, and they found in our current politics that it comes to transgender people and particularly trans youth, 
that there are that there's some traction with some elements of the American pro, uh, public that is giving them, say, uh, some new energy, um, um, and 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 we're seeing, yeah, states pass, proposing and passing legislation on these topics. Perfect. I'll add too that, um, and I think I saw something, a question similar to this in the Q&A as well, but this idea that the belief in the gender binary is inherently, um, you know, results in negative attitudes toward trans people, you know, that's incorrect. And, I, and I've seen some conservative commentary using PRI's numbers to, to argue this incorrect point. Mm -hmm. But of course, for, again, this is my historian hat, right? For generations, you could only obtain care by pronouncing the right that I was born this and one and have always felt like this and you had two options right so there are systems in place that I think generationally have forced transgender and non-binary people to adapt the, the this belief in the gender binary so we really need to pay attention to that I think I wonder too if in future surveys you know if we asked about um, ideas or beliefs about biological sex versus beliefs about uh, the, the, the spectrum of gender identities, the results would almost certainly be different, I think in part because of this generational difference. But I think it's really important to keep in mind that up until 10 years ago, gender dysphoria was a disorder, right? In the DSM. And so of course, trans people, some trans people were forced to buy into the binary. So I think that's a really important distinction too that will be changing, I'm certain of that. Great, thank you so much. We have a lot of questions in the Q&A. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I wanted just to kind of have a broader question. This was the first one that um, was, was listed. Do Americans, so I just, anyone from the panel, feel free to jump in. Do Americans associate trans issues with political wokeness, wokeness in quotation marks? If so, is that association making people less receptive to thinking beyond the binary? So I guess it's a question of sort of our larger conversations about wokeness being, I think, advanced by some people, especially on the political right. Is that bleeding into Americans, um, you know, being less willing to think that there is, is there are more genders than, than just male, female? Any thoughts on that? from our panel. Well, I can jump in with a, an observation that comes to mind, which is that um, earlier this year, former President Trump, when talking about his next campaign for president, said mm -hmm. that one of the leading GOP issues of the day was transgender rights, essentially, was defining laws based on, quote unquote, biological sex. So I think in that way, um, the Republican Party has used this issue to represent the left, to represent progressives. And so I think that can go one of two ways, that it can mean that it makes people, as the question says, less receptive to thinking beyond the binary if they buy into these conservative politics. But I think it also might mean that progressives who might otherwise not have contact with transgender people, although we see that those numbers are also on the rise from this survey, but that they also might care about this issue as a progressive issue that concerns all of us, not just LGBT people and their allies. Other thoughts on that topic? Um, well, building off of what Kelsey just said, mm -hmm. I would, um, it is often the case, say, if you look at, say, the political messaging and communications around um, LGBTQ equality over time, that um, that usually the dominant frames and the, and the central understandings um, tend to be controlled uh, for whatever reason by more religiously and socially conservative uh, groups um, or those that say are on the anti-LGBTQ side. For example, um, uh, when the military uh, readiness, uh, military and uh, uh, LGBTQ people being able to serve openly in the military, uh, one of the common dominant frames of understanding was that allowing uh, LGBTQ people to serve openly harms the military readiness. And that was the dominant frame. And so advocates that were more supportive of open service actually used research to kind of highlight how keeping people in the closet harms the military readiness, right? They had to respond on that dominant frame. 
Um, similarly, when it came to marriage equality, a lot of this was, if marriage equality happens, you're, this is gonna be taught to your children in schools, right? And that became the dominant frame, such that LGBT marriage equality activists had to kind of remind people that children learn their values at home, right? Um, and had to kind of, uh, but they still had to respond to that dominant frame. And so here, if we're thinking, talking about our current political moment and this kind of way to, way to kind of typify the left as being kind of gender fluid um, and trying to stigmatize, say, gender fluidity, well, now there's this like dominant frame again of that there is this binary gender system that uh, affects, say, uh, uh, what bathrooms people use, um, you know, sports and athletics and all these kinds of things. And so, by that becoming now the dominant approach, that dominant frame, now we have now people are responding in a way that I think is kind of reactionary to this idea that there is this binary gender system. Um, and so, when you think about what is the political messaging going to look like in the future, it's kind of going to have to kind of think about. What are they saying and how do we take what they're trying to say and actually flip it or actually tell people kind of bring people back to a type, a type of comfort um, that they may have less comfort with right now. We're already seeing this when it comes to parental rights. Um, uh, there's a, more uh, organizations that are, have been mobilized uh, to kind of say, if you really do care about parental rights, why is the state, why are there state policies that are pro prohibiting parents from being able to care for their transgender and non-binary youth, right? And so to kind of take the dominant frame of parental rights and already begin to re reappropriate it to a way that actually affirms what parents can do for their children, as opposed to what we're seeing in our current policy. I think that gets back to Heath's point about parental rights is such an abstract sort of concept. Of course, parents wanna be involved, but what are the details? And I think the flip side of the parental rights argument when it comes, for example, to transgender children is that those parents wanna safeguard their rights to be able to medically treat their children, right? So there is, I think, another way to look at that, that lens. Um, this, one of the respondents or one of the um, attendees asked about religion uh, more specifically. I think that Andrew did a good job of answering some of that, but just wanted to talk maybe to both Heath and Tuzana here, because as, as a historian, as someone Heath who's looked, uh, I think, uh, more at the role of religion and driving debates about public schools in particular, um, to what extent do you think that these debates that we're having in state legislatures are really driven by religion um, more than partisanship or just kind of, or is it just essentially that evangelicals now have become a Republican, so we're talking about the same sorts of issues. So what are some of the, the religious dimensions you see being played out here on these debates? I guess I could jump in very, very briefly um, and and say that I, I think I, I agree with the the so the premise and the direction of your question. Uh, and I think I would I would uh, agree that that partisanship and the link between uh, religion partisanship makes it very difficult to to disaggregate these mm -hmm. these factors. You know the the work that I've done on the homeschooling movement, uh, I think reinforces, the very close relationships between uh, party mobilization and relig religious mobilization uh, in some parts of the country, particularly rural communities where homeschooling has been so prominent. Uh, I think for many of these uh, communities, um, they don't uh, see a distinction in many cases uh, between their uh, partisan identity and, and uh, their identity as, as peoples of faith. Uh, and so I think the the, the confluence of those uh, that that mobilization, uh, especially among religious conservatives, uh, makes it very difficult empirically to tease those out. Uh, descriptively and historically I, and institutionally, I think it's much easier to see the way the overlaps uh, between these two uh, two or three different institutional forces have come together. I think it's important to not let the narrative of, um, well, the white evangelical theolo theological understanding of gender that is actually, again, quite current, right? The, the, all of these um, theologies emerged only after the mid 20th century in response to the, the rising visibility of 
gender non-conforming and um, queer people. Um, I think what's really, or what could be useful, and we see a variety of opinions, and also one of your slides, right, looked at the religious breakdown of, of views on gender. I think it's really important to emphasize those different stories, right? We are on lands of indigenous people who have always, most of those societies have believed in a vast variety of genders, right? And um, there are just religious traditions that are Protestant and progressive who since the 70s and 80s written a lot and celebrated gender diversity in their midst. So I think one of the things that we should also remember is that the narratives we're hearing about these you know, white evangelical um, concerns with gender identity and sexuality are just truly a minority in the broader historical narrative. Great, well, I think I'm gonna end on one other question that touches some of those themes and kind of picks up on something that Susanna had raised a little bit earlier. You know, she wrote a wonderful spotlight that took a look at um, uh, essentially, even though Americans know that transgender Americans are discriminated against and are facing hostility, it doesn't seem to move the needle on in terms of greater acceptance. So I guess this is a larger question. Um, you know, we are showing more, I think, hostility to trans rights in, in our polling data here. We've talked about some of the reasons that we're seeing that today in American society. But how do we change that going forward in schools, elsewhere? Um, and also relatedly, I'm going to add this, this is not quite the same question here, but, um, but you know, how do we sort of introduce folks to the concept of what it means to be transgender? Like, do we move people beyond people who especially are firmly, um, strongly believing that gender identity really is just involves just being the, the male female sort of perspective here. So how do we move forward in terms of uh, more acceptance of these rights, or do we see a situation where Americans would be more broadly accepting of these rights in public opinion? And I'll open that to the floor. Well, sure, I'll jump in to get us started. <laughs> I mean, this is the question, right? I feel like as social scientists, for many of us, that it's like we we don't tend to answer that question when we just are analyzing sort of empirical data, the what next or how do we move forward what I've been observing in my state in Nebraska, as we've seen these attacks come through the legislature, is that it has brought, in, brought people out who would not otherwise be speaking out in favor of transgender people and transgender rights. Parents who have kids that are affected by these laws, who never wanted to be in the spotlight, never considered themselves to be political activists. These parents have extended families who love these kids, who want the best for them. And so in some ways, the um, focus and attack on transgender people and transgender youth in particular is going to have a rippling effect that I think pulls people in who will speak out against, against these efforts. Time will tell if this shows up in the public opinion uh, polls or data, but that in some ways gives me hope, even as I live in a state that has passed some of this legislation, that I've seen so much opposition to it and from many unlikely folks. And uh, to build off of that, one thing that we see from this survey is that there are certain policies that have passed, at least uh, at various states, where at the national level are actually unpopular. Um, um, that, you know, that there is a more, much more openness of the American public to introducing topics around LGBTQ people in schools, right, to, uh, uh, there's a strong opposition to, you know, these policies that are restricting the ability of parents to care for their trans youth, uh, or their trans children, uh, even across the generations, right, so even the boomer generation, mm -hmm. there's a majority that don't like, don't think, that oppose those policies. Um, uh, so I think that that's one, uh, one thing to highlight. Secondly, as you talk about in terms of uh, what might move the needle, um, what might move the needle is actually what we're seeing right now in terms of the increased salience around transgender and non-binary people. Some of my own experiments from uh, just a few years ago kind of showed that even if you just provide people with a more comprehensive definition of what transgender means, increases people's own self-reported comfort with, with you know, transgender people, and also reduces beliefs in this gender binary system, you know. Um, and so it opens people's uh, opens people up into to new experiences. 
Um, uh, and I would just say that there have been other studies that kind of indicate that, you know, that if you allow uh, people uh, the opportunity to kind of put themselves in the shoes of trans people and to kind of think about how they might go about, about their day to day lives and the difficulties they may encounter, that that exercise actually helps people kind of ground themselves to be more, you know, supportive of trans people, right? It builds more empathy. Um, and so I think going forward, it's kind of about what stories are people telling and how do people kind of relate to transgender people? And, you know, and this increased salience might actually, you know, help that help move that along. Wonderful. Well, I can't believe an hour and 13 minutes have already passed, but this is a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you all for your wonderful insights here. And I think we're about ready to wrap up our our webinar. So I'm going to turn it back to Belen, our strategic engagement associate. Thank you very much. Ooh, yes, well, we have covered a lot of ground. <laughs> um, thank you so much to Melissa and our panelists for walking us through and helping us to kind of contextualize this data. Um, and thank you so much to all of our webinar attendees who have joined us today. Um, if you want to learn more about key findings from this report and other work from PRRI, please follow us on Instagram. Please follow us on Twitter at PRRI poll. You can also check us out at PRRI.org for our latest facts and findings. Um, yeah, that's a wrap. Thanks so much for joining. <laughs>